15 jurors have returned. Are we have calling of the roll? Yes, Your Honor. Yes, sir. Yes, Judge. Yes, Judge. Good afternoon, Detective Dockin. Good afternoon. May I approach the witness, Judge? May. I'm handing you what's remarked as Commonwealth's Exhibit 155. Can you tell me what that is? Uh, yes, it is a close-up image of um, a pair of jeans that we saw earlier. And I just wanted to clear up a bit of your testimony from direct examination. I believe you referred to that as a cut that was on those jeans. Uh, if I did, uh, I'm not sure what it is. I can't tell you if it's a cut, a rip, fabric failure, uh, nor can the Kentucky State Police uh, okay, not make that determination. Floor. Yes, it is no longer connected. Okay. Detective Cochran, you presented an exhibit, I believe it was a bottle of bleach. Where did you say you found that? Um, I believe, um, if I can refer to it, okay, you sir. can refer to it. Um, that is item number 46, and that was found in Mr. Yeska's office. It was located in Mr. Yeska's office. <clears throat> I'm going to go through um, your report in a little while about some <coughs> items that you tested for fingerprints and otherwise are submitted to the lab. Yes. But if you recall in your report, did you test that item? I don't believe so. Okay, so you didn't test it for fingerprints or anything of that nature? I don't believe so, sir. That was the application of the blue star in the hallway uh, near the women's restroom showing the large blood stain. Showing the large blood stain outside the women's room? Outside the women's restroom as well as the trail leading down the hall to the unfinished portion of the mezzanine. Um, is this the only area of this second floor where you applied blue star? <clears throat> no. Where else did you apply blue star? Uh, as I testified earlier, we also did so in Tom Seaman's office. Uh, our primary concern, the reason we did it in Tom Seaman's office as well, there was also a um, sink in Mr. Seaman's a private bathroom. So we had concerns uh, that the perpetrators may have washed up in that bathroom. So we applied it throughout Mr. Seaman's office uh, up there as well. And then later the next day, um, downstairs in the janitor's closet. Um, but as far as the upstairs area, you just applied it? What, in Tom Seaman's office and then here in this hallway? In that hallway, yes, sir. Did you ever apply any blue star going back to where Mr. Yeska's office? Um, I don't recall. You don't recall? I don't recall. I don't, I don't, I don't believe so, um, but I'm not, I, 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 didn't, I don't recall. I don't think so, though. Okay. Um, there are no photographs of it, which is why I'm asking you. The, the, there are no photographs. If there was blue star applied, the results were negative. Okay. So you would have... So we would have documented if there was some type of result, just like we did with Mr. Seaman's office. Okay. And there was nothing in your report that reflected that being true? That's correct. On this exhibit, it looks like the, I guess what would you say, the trailing back toward the door going out to the mezzanine or mostly linear lines? Yes, sir. I would agree with that. And... Just looking at this photograph, you don't see any sort of stray marks or any sort of blood anywhere else that indicate the movement of limbs or anything of that nature. Would you agree? Uh, as I said earlier, I can't testify as to exactly who developed this pattern out here. I, I cannot tell you um, what created those. I, I just can't say. But these are just essentially just straight linear lines proceeding all the way back. Yes, that line... Line goes back towards the door. You can see there's a little bit of a line here, but it is a, a relatively um, linear line. It could be from a limb. It could be from a cart. I, I can't tell you. It could be from what now? It could be from it could be from like a limb, like you said, or right. it could be from a cart. Thank you. Um, did you see 
any evidence of any blood on any vertical surfaces or walls? I did not. Okay. So there was, well, you said there was a little bit of luminescence in Mr. Seaman's office? That's correct. And you saw luminescence in the hallways? That's correct. But you saw no signs of any sort of luminescence or any blood on any wall or vertical surface? Uh, no, sir. Did you not, see? not in that portion of the office. When we get out to the mezzanine unfinished area, there were clearly some vertical surfaces. There. And that was what you talked about was the impact spatter, yes. correct? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, did you see any kind of damage to the to the drywall or to the to the walls in that area of the office that you documented? No, sir. Is there any sort of broken furniture or anything else that looked out of place in, in that area of the office? There was no broken furniture. There was one chair that was kind of strangely towards the middle of the room, but other than that, it wasn't damaged in any way, uh, nothing of that nature. Is there an indication of why that chair was in the middle of the room? There is not. I don't know if it was kept there in the course of business for some reason, but um, I'm not sure why. The chair you're talking about that you're referencing? Yes, sir. What exhibit? It's a Commons 51. Okay. And so your testimony today is that, that when you got there, that, that chair was in that position? Yes. I don't know if it was put there after the incident, prior to the incident. I'm not sure. It just seemed to be in an odd position. That chair pointed back, to, I guess it was angled from what well, you said. Let me put it back. Yeah. So it's angled, it's removed from the wall and then angled back into the room towards Michelle's office. Um, kind of between Michelle's office and that empty office space where they kind of just kept supplies and stuff. It's kind of aimed sort of between there. But yeah, between there's a wall that goes between that empty office space and Michelle's, and it's kind of aimed in that direction. The seat of it is, I should say. Right. Yeah. Do you recall Detective Cochran giving prior sworn testimony um, about this case? Uh, I do, sir. Do you ever recall being asked the question um, as to where that chair, as to how that chair got into the middle of that room? Um, I, I do not recall. Okay. So do you, do you recall testifying that when you arrived at the scene in that open area of the office, Judge, it was... I'm going to object. I would like the witness to have an opportunity to view a statement. Okay. Yeah, sustain. Approach. You bet. Okay. <clears throat> Yes, I do recall. This was a separate chair, not the chair in the upper office area. It was the chair in the lower office area. So your testimony today is that there was the chair in the lower office area? Yeah, there was one in the lower office area. I believe it was over evidence number 29, if I recall properly. It was a small drop of suspected blood that they had found during the search. Uh, we talked about it yesterday, phenolphthalein testing it and having negative results. Okay, and I suppose, well, is it fair to say that you and Detective Carnahan were working as a two-man team? 
Uh, that, yes, absolutely. Okay, so we'll hear testimony from Detective Carnahan on that point, I'm sure. Um, I want to get into this idea of, of bleach. There was no evidence that any sort of bleach was used on the second floor of that office area, true? Um, that is correct. We saw no um, false positive, what I would consider a false positive indicative of bleach, that really quick flash that I talked about. Um, nor was there an odor. Um, was there an odor of bleach? No, sir. And so the, the, the false positive you're talking about is with the blue star, correct? Right, yes, sir. So when you apply the blue star, or you would see blood, you'd get a really kind of dull image when it's in the dark, it would fluoresce in the dark. That's correct. But with blue star applied to bleach, it would be a quick, <laughs> flash. super bright flash. Yes, sir. And so you saw no evidence of that? No, sir. So the only things that you saw luminescing, I guess you could... You could say then was was the blood that was, was likely there. blood. Yes, sir. That is one of the gel lifts from the area around Michelle's body. And so that's the gel lift that you applied to that dirty, dusty concrete floor? Yes, sir. It was in the mezzanine? Yes, sir. I believe your testimony was that you could see impressions with your eye. Isn't that true? Well, we could see the start of an impression, not clearly a full impression. We did the best um, to photograph those that we could, what we could see with our eye, and then we moved on to the next process, which was the gel lifter. And so those, those photographs you're taking of those lifters, or, or, or the warehouse floor for that matter, mm -hmm. are straight up and down? Yes, sir. So the camera is positioned uh, essentially directly above what it is you're trying to take a picture of? Yes, sir. And that's standard in law enforcement practice? Yes, we get as close to 90 as possible. It makes it much easier for analysis later. Because you can tell the size of things. You can put a ruler beside it and tell the scale. Yeah, because if you take a picture of a ruler from the, the rulers laying here and you take it in an angle, it's more difficult. And so you're not really going to have any measurements that you can go back on at that point. That well, you can reference. I mean, you, you could, but it'd be You much can. Um, the, the way we do that is with Photoshop. There are ways that we can extrapolate from an image that's not perfect. Um, it can be rescaled and used by an analyst. It, so, can, it can, but it's not standard law enforcement practice. We do the best that we can given the circumstances, uh, knowing that um, we can have that corrected at a later time if need be. Um, but suffice it to say, this is a picture that's taken from the top down, correct? 90 degrees, what you're saying? Relatively close. Okay. The pictures you took of the warehouse floor that showed the impressions on the warehouse floor, those were 90 degrees as well. Some, uh, some of them were, and some of them, um, in particular the one that we saw earlier, was taken at more of an oblique angle, an oblique angle. because the, you couldn't see it as well from the top down, but you could see it better from an oblique angle, trying to show what it was we saw and why we were going to try to develop it further. So you were trying to take a photograph of what you could see. Right. It was, and sometimes 90 doesn't allow for that, so we had to modify our right. procedure. And so the, the ultimate conclusion that you made after you pulled those lifters is that you could not develop any sort of tread pattern. You could not see any kind of, or identify a particular tread pattern. That is correct. I, I, I cannot recall who um, analyzed that, but I, the decision was ultimately, once it was all taken back and analyzed, yes, sir. And so you could see what you thought was one, but you just could not make out what it was. And yes, we did the best to lift we could. And the same is true with fingerprints in many cases, isn't that right? How so, sir? Well, you try to, you're going to, for instance, when you're trying to super glue fume something or you're trying to look for a latent print, you might see a partial print. There could be a print there, but you may not get a great picture of it. True. You can have what's called a patent print and not a latent print. A patent print is one you can see without any development. So, yeah, sometimes if we see something ahead of time, 
we'll take a photograph of that prior to any of the chemistry or anything like that. Yes, sir. So, for instance, I believe in your report, well, let's just let's just go through it. You reviewed a few, or you um, examined a few items in your report that you attempted to develop prints off of. Yes, sir. Let me know when you get with me. Yes, sir. I have the uh, report here. Okay. So you attempted to, I think you said you attempted to take fingerprints off the, the tape ligatures? That is correct. Okay. There was also the time cards. You attempted to get fingerprints from them? That is correct. Um, you, you fumed the Applebee's bag and attempted to get prints from, the, from that bag? Correct. Um, you tried a different technique with the day planner, I assume, because it's a different type of surface? Um, really because we were looking for blood impressions. We were trying to find blood impressions, and the titanium dioxide we used is particularly good at bringing out contrast on a dark background with blood impressions such as that. And so you were attempting to get an impression off that as well? Yes, sir. And then you also, the bag, and I believe you said the utility knife. Yes, sir. Neither of those produced any kind of latency that you could observe. That's The correct. bag or the utility knife? That is correct. And in a photograph, and I don't believe I had it pulled, but in the photograph with the Applebee's bag, you also were fuming the, the Diet Coke cans? Yeah, it could be, sir. But you need to The Diet Coke cans. I'll look through them if you want me to. I can cut. Just can keep going. Yeah, I'll find it. Okay, I'll circle back. Okay. okay. The, the tape ligatures, you testified that you also submitted those for DNA analysis. Is that correct? I did, sir. When you were at the scene, did you... You showed us the aluminum foil that you had the tape ligatures on. But when you were at the scene, is that how you package it? Was with the with aluminum foil? No, I believe at that time what we didn't want to do, we wanted to have a minimal exposure uh, to anything. So we loosely placed them on the least adhesive surface into a paper bag just for the limited purpose of transporting it back to the agency where we could let it dry and then perform those additional tests. Are those the things that you had drying in the garage um, or in the bay? Uh, some sure of the part. things, I, I, I don't know which stage which things were drying, but okay. yes, sir, those were, we did dry them in the bay at some juncture. And so you leave them out to dry um, before you repackage them in the aluminum foil? That's correct. And we're going to break them down to a smaller package, package them more tightly. Once we get everything separated, we're going to have individual packets. Um, yes, that's, that we're going to make sure they're dried first. Okay. And so, and that's, I suppose that's why you, the testing that you did was maybe a couple weeks down the road in addition to the other cases that you were working on. Right. Um, as, as well as this case, um, usually when we process things of this nature, we don't get to those immediately because um, we know that, in particular with the DNA, it is not going to be a situation in which we are going to get a quick turn time from the lab. The lab takes a considerable amount of time to get things done. Uh, I don't know what the turn time was at the time, but it's not one of the things we rush to that's going to help to forward the investigation immediately. Okay. So when you, I guess, well, first of all, let's start with super glue fuming. It's your testimony, and it's, it's true in science, I suppose, that when you fume something, it doesn't destroy the DNA that could be on that potential item. That's a true statement. True statement, yes. So you're super glue fuming the item so that you can get a better impression off of it. Um, yes, uh, it can develop one of those latent prints into a paper print. Basically, adds a layer of super glue to a print that you can't see and makes it very durable. Yes, sir. So, suppose it's so whatever your skin. I guess it's amino acids in your skin. It can be a variety of things. It can be um, amino acids. It can be um, eccrine secretions, sebaceous secretions. Um, but a lot of times what we see is even just contamination from the cheeseburger you ate for lunch. Um, that's really the best, uh, some type of contamination. It's probably going to be the best print that you get. So it can be a variety of things. It's just all dependent. Right. And so, but the super glue actually bonds to that. It will bond better to um, water than it will anything else. It doesn't bond as well to sebaceous or fatty material. 
Right. But you've teamed it so that you can get a better print. That you we want try. To get a, a, solid, a more solid impression. We try. Okay. Um, I'm going to approach Judge. Can I show you what's been marked as 135, 136, and 137. Can you identify those photographs? Yes, sir. Those are um, portions of the um, tape as we separated it and uh, pictures of the tape in the super rear tuning chamber. Where, where is that photograph? You said it's actually before. Is that after, excuse me, before you put it in the feeling chamber? I would have to look through my sequence of photos um, to tell you 100% for sure. Um, predominantly because um, the super glue fuming yielded very little results. A lot of times, and we wanted to not fume too heavily because of the potential for DNA. Um, we wanted to do it with a nice light fume. So um, I, I can look through my sequence of photos and I can tell you exactly um, in the sequence of the processing, that's why we take them. You can take my word for it. <laughs> okay. I looked at the timestamps. So okay. Comes before. Um, so the process of actually getting this tape to come apart, because it's, it was kind of bundled up, right? Yes, very tight. And so it, that took you quite a bit of time to get that done. Uh, yes, sir, it did. So the way you did it, I think if I understood your testimony, was that you applied I think, dry ice to the... Right. Well, what we did was is we sanitized a cooler, um, and once the cooler was sanitized, um, we put dry ice into the cooler, and then we would place the tape on top of the dry ice in the cooler until dry ice is very, very cold. Um, it would freeze the tape, sort of, for lack of a better term, help to neutralize some of that adhesive, and it would make it easier for the tape to pull apart. As we would pull it apart, it would come back up to room temperature, and it would start to stick again, so we would stop back into onto the dry ice and attempt to pull the tape apart. And so you're, for each one of these steps, you're taking the tape and pulling it apart? Yes, right? sir. And so at the end of that, you hope to have a straighter piece of tape? Well, a, a piece of tape that's more suitable for both um, DNA and late printing examination. Yes, so sir. something that isn't just in a, in a bond? Yeah, in a ball. Hopefully there's something there evidentiary. Okay. So when you, you've gone through this process and you've pulled it apart, refrozen it, pulled it apart, refrozen it, pulled it apart, and refrozen it, and then you fume it, you haven't destroyed any of the DNA that's on the item, correct? Well, that is a hope, in particularly with an adhesive surface such as that, whereas epithelials that we are looking for on Michelle's arm are just kind of brushed off and been sitting there. Tape is particularly good because when you put your thumb onto tape, it literally... Not only will it remove um, the epithelials, but it will also bind to that adhesive. So, yeah, that's, that's, that's a pretty good opportunity there. Right. And so the process of you freezing the tape is specifically so that you deactivate the adhesive. Right. There's numerous ways to deactivate the adhesive. Um, there's chemical methods as well as um, the freezing method. But the freezing method is the least destructive to the DNA, and that's why we did that. Okay. Um, and the photograph... First off, how many, how many cells, if you know, you may not know the answer, how many cells does it take to potentially get a touch DNA profile? I would, I would have to refer that to the, the uh, DNA analyst. For different agencies, the number is actually different. They have what are called thresholds, and they can explain those better to you um, on what their thresholds are. Suffice it to say, it's a, it's a small amount of cells. Uh, it's much smaller than it used to be, sir. Okay. Yes. Maybe even a handful. And I'll, I'll go back into the DNA expert with that. Yeah. That's the one later in the trial. Um, on this particular exhibit, can you see the margins, the plates of, of blood? Yes, sir. And so the, the blood that was on the tape that you froze and when you pulled it apart, you froze and you pulled it apart, mm -hmm. that blood actually flaked and came off. It will flake and come off, absolutely. Okay. Um, that's one of our concerns both with this and uh, 
other plastic bags as we looked at before, like flakes off. Yes, sir. And so were you actually doing the dry ice process on this piece of aluminum foil? Did yes. You call it? Yes, uh, absolutely, just for that reason. On this very piece or a different piece? Yes, thing? yes, we did it on we did it on the foil. Okay. Um, just to catch, because we know it's going to flake off. We know it's going to happen. Right. And so if this is right before you put it in the fuming chamber, so you were doing this dry ice process on the same foil, and keeping the tape on the same foil, and then putting the fuming chamber on the same foil? Yes, I believe so. Okay, so it was... Was it hours that you testified that you were doing that? Um, I don't know if it was hours. It was a long period of time. And that was all part of one process? Um, the, I mean, the really, yes. lo the really long time you spent with the... We spent a long time with the tape, um, but as you saw in the photos, I'm, I've got other things going through the tank at the same time, so it's hard to say that I spent just that time on from such and such time to such and such time on just the tape. Um, I, I can't tell you that for sure. You might have left that to the side and then gone to do to some something other else. Come back. I can't. I can't tell you, sir. Okay. Um, when you got done with this entire process, did you did you send this entire thing to the lab? Um, yes, I packaged them up. Hopefully, so they would not stick back together. You saw the individual packets, and I shipped those to the lab. Your approach, Judge. What's in Marcus Connell's 38 detective proper? Can you tell me what that is? Um, that is um, the Applebee's bag, a purse, and um, the day planner. And where was that located? Um, that is, again, just, the, just in the upper left hand corner of that photo, you can see the um, door going into the finished area of the mezzanine. It's that door between the finished area and the unfinished area of the mezzanine. I think you testified on your direct testimony that we know that the perpetrator, uh, the person who killed Michelle Mockby, moved those items there. Well, we think that that's a strong possibility, yes. Correct? Yes, absolutely. It would be a pretty safe assumption to make. Uh, I would say so, sir. All of her belongings are, are right there. Probably should be there. Okay. Shouldn't be there, yes. Okay. And as far as, as we know that, the items that are in this particular photograph are extremely, could be extremely valuable as far as providing evidence of identifying the person who committed this crime. Would you agree? Uh, they could be, yes, sir. And that if you were able to identify something off of that that wasn't supposed to be there, it would be pretty good evidence. That's correct. Do you recall what was in that Applebee's bag? All the items that were in it? I do not recall the items. I can tell you there were a large amount of items within the Applebee's bag. Uh, lots of paperwork, bills, things of that nature. Um, I remember there being newspapers. Uh, there, some shoes were in there. There, there was a there was a wide variety of things in there. Approach eighty three. That's Commonwealth eighty three. Will you review that? Yes, sir. Item number 25, it is a um, gold earring um, that was next to um, Michelle's head. Did you see a corresponding injury? Well, scratch that, we'll get into that next week. Um, where's the other one? Um, I believe it was in the Applebee's bag, if I'm correct. I would have to refer just to make double sure, but I believe so. You can, if, you, if you want to refer before you testify, you can. Yeah. I, I believe it was in there. I don't see the photo, I believe Detective Carnahan actually took some of those photos. Um, I don't have it in front of me, but I believe it was in the Apple Bay. Her earring, one earring is found on the floor of the mezzanine, right beside her body. 
the other ring is found, the other earring is found somewhere else. Can you can you say how that would have happened? I cannot for sure. Um, I mean, uh, you would think that someone put it in the bag. It's true. The time cards were also in that police bag. Is that true? That is true. And they had blood spatter on them. Correct. Uh, I don't believe it was spatter. I believe it was transfer. Transfer? Yes. When you a bloody saw... item comes into contact with another surface, blood's transfer. Okay. So you saw some blood transfer on the time cards in the Applebee's bag. That's true? That's correct. And that was even that blood was even swabbed, I think you testified on direct. Yes, we did take a sample of that prior to testing for latent prints. Okay. Was that earring the other earring ever submitted for laboratory analysis? Uh, it was not. Did you do any laboratory analysis as far as fingerprints or DNA on any of the other items that were found in that bag, if you can recall that? Um, I don't believe so. So the items that you tested for DNA that are inside that Applebee's bag are which ones? here, and I don't believe we tested anything from within the bag. So you know the person that committed the murder, that's the time cards, and the time cards are in the bag, and it's fair to say that the person who committed the murder touched the earring and placed it in the bag as well. Potentially, yes, sir. Okay. And none of the items, you did not submit any of the items that were in that bag for testing for DNA? Yes, sir, we did not. Okay. Um, the, the time cards... Actually, do you have the do you have a, the time cards as an exhibit? The five that were found. Um, they are within the uh, Applebee's bag, but yes, sir. Could you could you pull that out? Exhibit that's been referenced yet. Is that right, I'm gonna, I guess I'll. Okay. We can mark it. Just make sure we're. What are we on? Judge? We're on six. That's what I have here. Do you want to just do that? It came, it's from within this larger item. Let's just mark the entire item. Okay. Piece of paper for him, sure. and then we'll do that. Okay. Well, we can actually just show them to the jury if that's all right. Can he sit down, Judge? You may. Detective Cochran, did 
those time cards come to you with holes in them? They did not. Did you cut? Did you cut those time cards? I did, at your behest. And those were submitted for DNA analysis, to your knowledge. They were. Okay. Whoops. So that was her DNA that was on the cards. Yeah, and it, that's what the laboratory testing said. It is, and so what I'm what I'm asking you simply is, were those cards cut and tested at the behest of the defense? They were. Okay. Was there any other testing in this case that was performed at the request of the defense? There was. Um, earlier we saw um, Michelle's blouse. It had some black material. I talked about the Amido black um, that was on that an attempt to develop any additional fingerprints, um, we did treat that um, for you. And so, describe a amino black. Is it, does it help you see things that maybe are shrouded by blood or some other substance? It, it can enhance a light blood impression. Um, there is the potential for that. Um, absolutely. Is there an area on that shirt that you could refer to as maybe a, look, what, look, what would look like a handprint? can't say for sure. Um, there is a pattern there to be sure, um, but there is a, definitely a pattern there to say exactly what that is. There's also a lot of um, fold over and then impression. So what happens is um, a piece of cloth is folded over like this and then an impression is placed on it and the cloth is laid out flat again. It gives the impression of very sharp lines and that kind of stuff. So, But there is a pattern on the back of the shirt. Um, that some have construed as a hand impression, but I cannot testify um, that that's what that is. Correct. And when you when you looked at that impression as it existed naturally on the shirt, we'll, we'll take one step back. What color was the shirt? Uh, it was, it was a it was a white shirt. It was a white shirt. Yes, sir. Okay. And it had that area of the blood stain that we'll call potentially a handprint on it. Um, yes, sir. The amido black was applied to attempt to discern if there were any impressions, what you would call it. Was, is that the correct word, is impressions? Uh, yes, if there were any latent impressions, um, yes. The impressions on the shirt that could be identified to a particular individual. Potentially. That, that is correct. <coughs> but ultimately none were. None were. Just can we approach? Good. We're back for lunch. During the trial of any case, is your not video not to form or express an opinion until the case is submitted to you and not to converse with or allow yourself to be addressed by any other person who will be subject to the trial. Uh, you are instructed to uh, no officer party witness or attorney should have to talk to the information report. You are also instructed to report any unlawful attempt to contact you. This is our previously to the bail or to myself. And further, do not do any kind of research on utilizing both your read, listen to, or view any news media accounts of the trial, including utilizing your smartphones, televisions, and computers. And uh, don't visit the material fact in any place in which where any material facts occur without authorization from the court. We'll be back at 1.30. All rise. <clears throat> Sure you have your buttons on, I think everyone does.
anything we need to address before we break? No. We'll just make sure we're back maybe five minutes early just to make sure there's no issues.